Now, I'm delighted to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Leif Wenar, uh, whose current position is the Chair of Philosophy and Law at King's College London School of Law. He is a philosopher who holds a PhD in philosophy from Harvard University, where he studied with some of the most influential philosophers of our time, uh, such as John Rawls, uh, Robert Nozick, and T.M. Scanlon. And since that time, he has published a number of important articles and books, and he is here today to talk about his most recent major publication, Blood Oil, Tyrants, Violence, and the Rules that Run the World, uh, which is available for purchase after the lecture, um, and uh, there will be a book signing following the lecture. Now, this book is a tool to force. It masterfully captures how our daily consumption of oil and other related goods is connected to repression and human rights violations in oil, ex oil exporting countries far, far away from us. And it also offers a concrete solution to this problem that would relieve us from the uh, complicity that we have unwittingly become ensnared in. And this book is written lucidly and convincingly with illustrative empirical examples from a wide variety of places in different historical periods. He, uh, for example, takes us back in time to the English Civil War of the 17th century, the anti-slavery movement of the 19th century, and the anti-apartheid campaign in the late 20th century. And he offers detailed analysis of a number of countries, uh, ranging from Nigeria, Congo, Equatorial Guinea, uh, Botswana, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Iraq, two countries like Norway, Britain, US, Canada, Australia, and China. And all these empirical examples combine with persuasive philosophical reasoning to make the case that buying oil uh, from countries run by dictators serves nobody's interest except for the interest of a handful of people who monopolize uh, oil wealth. And also that there is a viable alternative to the status quo if we can change an archaic legal principle of might makes right and start living in the world of popular resource sovereignty, the world in which natural resources are owned by people, not by dictators. And these provocative and inspiring arguments have sparked a series of discussions and the book has been featured in many media outlets such as the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, CNN, BBC, and many others. And a sequence book that features exchanges between several prominent scholars and Professor Wenau has just also been released, Beyond Blood Oil, uh, Philosophy, Policy, and the Future. Now, you might be intimidated at first glance uh, by this book, this uh, nearly 500-page book uh, written by a philosopher trained at Harvard, teaching now at King's College. Uh, but this book is really just a, a joy to read um, as he lays out his arguments in an extremely accessible way and invites you to a dialogue with him throughout the book, as the best works of uh, philosophy tend to do. And we are privileged to have him today to have this dialogue with all of you in person. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Leif Wenar. Thanks so much, Peter. Thanks so much. First thing I'm going to do is get this guy off the screen, because however bad that is, seeing one of me is enough. So thanks so very much for the invitation. I'm really grateful to you and grateful to be part of this series here. I'm also really grateful for the hospitality of the center and especially to Dr. Donia, who makes things like this amazing place happen. The more you go around the world, the more you realize things like this really do depend on individuals. So it's really special when we can come together and talk about these kinds of issues in a space like this. What a privilege. So here we are talking about oil, and you can see from the picture that we've got some pretty grim topics to go through. But I promise you, by the end, the story will turn positive. 
since you're a sophisticated group of people, I'm just going to assume that if we started talking about oil, there's a lot that we would agree on. So I'm just going to assume that if we talked, we would agree that our governments in the West have engaged in many unjust actions for the sake of oil all over the world for many years, and especially in the Middle East. I'm also just going to assume that we would agree that our major oil companies have engaged in highly questionable and often exploitative actions all over the world for many years, and sometimes what they've done has been unjustifiable. I imagine if we talked, we would also take for granted amongst ourselves that we need to be getting off fossil fuels as fast as we possibly can for the sake of the climate. So since this is all stuff I imagine we agree on, I'm going to take it for granted and tell the story from the book that hasn't been told. This is a deeper story about how we as consumers are forced every day to fund much of the suffering and injustice that we see in the headlines, including headlines about our own crises. It's the law of our country that's putting us into business with some of the world's most violent and corrupt men when we do something as simple as fill up our cars. Now, I said we need to be getting off fossil fuels just as fast as we possibly can, but that is going to take some time. Right now, oil is humanity's largest source of energy. The world uses a thousand barrels of oil, it's almost three Olympic pools, a thousand barrels of oil each and every second. Over 90% of the world's transportation runs on oil, that's almost every car truck, ship, and plane that there is. And oil is not just transportation. Chemicals from oil are used in any number of products that we buy and use every day. So petroleum may be in your glasses, it may be in your waistband, you might have brushed your teeth with it this morning. You might have smeared it on your face. It might be helping your sex life. Oil is everywhere. And we pay for oil almost every time we go shopping. So where does the money that we spend on petroleum end up? Here's a map of the countries in black whose primary commodity export is oil. And there you see the world's main artery of oil stretching down from Russia through the Middle East into Africa and South America. So those are the big oil exporting countries. And here are the oil exporting countries that are either authoritarian or failed states. That's what social scientists call the resource curse. For some reason, natural resources and oil in particular are associated with a lot of trouble. Sometimes the resource curse is called the paradox of plenty. And here's one way of thinking of it. Consider all the amazing progress that the developing world has made in the past generation. Think of the economic growth in China and India, the third wave of democratization. In contrast to all of that progress, the major oil states in the developing world today are no richer, no freer, 
and no more peaceful on average than they were even in 1980. Oil is the world's largest commodity, over a trillion dollars a year. All of that money going into these countries, no richer, no freer, no more peaceful than they were. And in fact, the oil curse is behind the news that we see all the time. So here's six striking facts. Most autocrats rule oil states. Most civil wars are in oil states. Most refugees are from oil states. Most of the most corrupt states are in oil states. Most of the world's poor will soon be in oil states. And there's a sixth one, actually. Most of the countries with the most severe hunger crises are oil states. So I have to tell you, when I watch the news and I see the big stories coming on, I see the oil curse, the resource curse behind so many of them. When you think of the resource curse, you also can think of countries that don't make it into the news very often. Former Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan, where the government ruthlessly suppresses protesters, throwing civil society organization leaders into prison. Or you can think of Angola, a very oil-rich country where the elite lives in great luxury, while the children of the country have been dying literally at the highest rate in the world. Angola has been number one for under five child mortality with all of that oil money going in. The reason that oil is causing all of this trouble is a rule left over in global trade that we take for granted, but which is left over from the days of the Atlantic slave trade in the 17th century. This is the law of every country that says it'll be legal for us to buy resources like oil from whoever in foreign countries can control them by force. This is a rule that lawyers call effectiveness, and it really literally means might makes right. So, for example, years ago when Saddam Hussein's junta took over Iraq in a coup, it became legal for Americans to buy Iraq's oil from Saddam. And then years later when ISIS took over some of those same wells, it became legal for us to buy Iraq's oil from ISIS. That's why we had to impose sanctions on ISIS, otherwise it would have been legal for us to buy that oil. And it's not just an American rule. Every country in the world has this law of might makes right. Whoever can control it by force will buy the oil from them. Now, that's such an ancient rule that we just take it for granted that that's how the world works. But when you think about it, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, if an armed gang takes over that shell station down on Main Street, do you think American law should give the gang the right to sell off the gas and keep the money? No, that would cause chaos. But that's the kind of chaos that we actually do see in major oil and resource exporting countries because our laws actually do say might makes right. Now, oil is the world's largest commodity, so it causes most of the trouble, but we say might makes right for other resources too. In my phone, in your phone, there may be a small piece of the Congo that was harvested at gunpoint by one of the terrible militias in the Congo that's used sexual violence so extensively that the Congo has been called the worst place in the world to be a woman. But I can tell you 
Even if my phone, even if your phone, contains molecules from the Congo extracted by one of those terrible militias, you own your phone 100%, every molecule, free and clear, under the laws of the United States of America. It's not a metaphor. Might there turns into property rights here, and our money goes back to those militias to help them buy more bullets and more bayonets. We are in legal business relationships with these coercive and corrupt actors overseas. And for many years, they've been causing a lot of trouble with our money. This archaic law incites oppression and violence. And you can see why. I mean, you can do what philosophers call a thought experiment. Imagine for a moment that New York State passed a law that says any goods seized in New Jersey can be legally sold in New York, and the police and courts of New York will enforce those property rights. What do you think New Jersey would look like after a while? Well, you'd see kingpins, crime syndicates, extortion rackets, turf wars, just the kinds of things we actually do see on a much larger scale in resource-rich countries, because our law really does say might makes right. And here is the crucial political science point that comes out of all this research. Oil is the world's largest source of unaccountable power. Because we say, whoever can control the oil by force can sell it to us, authoritarians, armed groups, who can control oil wells, it's like they get a giant funnel of money coming in from the world. And that money comes in entirely without accountability. It's not like foreign aid. That money comes in from resources with no strings attached. It's much better for them than loans from the bank because with oil money, you never have to pay the money back. And best of all for them, the oil money comes in without any accountability to the people of the country who have to watch while their natural wealth is sold off from beyond their control. Oil is absolute power. And we know what happens when people get absolute power. Authoritarians that control oil wells can get rich and stay in power without needing a healthy, an educated, a productive population. They get all the money they need from controlling these holes in the ground. You can see how oil sustains oppressive rule. You can see it, for example, these days in Venezuela. If you've been watching Venezuela, they're reaching a million percent inflation now. The shortages of food and basic medicines in the country with the largest oil reserves in the world are reaching such a level that millions of people are now fleeing Venezuela because of fear of disease and starvation. So the oil curse comes from the unaccountable power that we unwillingly send through the law of effectiveness. And maybe you can see it coming. Oil ends up coming back and being trouble for us too. So now I'm just going to go through in reverse some of our biggest foreign policy threats and crises for the past 40 years. And as I go through in reverse some of our biggest problems that the West have faced, I'm just going to ask if you can see that there is one thing in common. So now we see Assad in Syria bombing his own people. Putin also bombing in Syria after having ordered the invasion of a European country and interfering, it seems, with our elections here and also in Europe. Putin's 
bombing in Syria has helped stimulate a refugee crisis that's put serious pressure on the politics of Europe. In the Syrian crisis, we saw ISIS with their atrocities and their beheadings. Before ISIS, Gaddafi, sponsor of 40 years of terrorism from the Olympic massacre in Munich to the Irish Republican Army. Before Gaddafi, Al-Qaeda. This was 7-7 in London. The bus blew up about 100 feet from my apartment. Al-Qaeda obviously also behind 9-11. Before Al-Qaeda, Saddam Hussein invading Kuwait in 1990. Since 1979, the Iranian regime has sponsored militant groups from Hezbollah to Islamic Jihad. And if you're as old as I am, you can remember the Soviet Union even surging ahead of the West in the nuclear arms race of the 1980s. All of those threats and crises for the West have one thing in common. They all come from countries that export a lot of oil. So the oil curse, the resource curse, is bad for them there. And because it's unaccountable power, it ends up being bad for us here, too. Now, we've tried strategies to try to control the unaccountable power from outside. For 40 years, the West has tried three major strategies to try to contain the power of oil. Sometimes we've made alliances with the Shah of Iran, or Saddam, or Gaddafi, or the Saudis. How is it working? Sometimes we try military actions. Gulf War I, Gulf War II, Gaddafi, cover the region in drones. How's it working? Sometimes we try sanctions. Iran, Iraq, Sudan, Syria, Russia. Even beyond the deaths and the expense and the damage to the West's reputation in these countries. You can, you can imagine what people say about the geostrategic effectiveness of these strategies. How's it working in the Middle East for stability? This is what the director of the CIA said when he was a couple years ago in front of Congress. The Middle East is the worst it's been in 50 years, and the region faces unprecedented bloodshed. The West can't control the power of oil from outside the country, and in fact, no one can. The resource curse is a very serious problem. There and here. And I'm very sorry to say that it looks like the problem is going to be getting even worse. The resource-rich countries, especially around the equator, are going to be getting hotter because of climate change and hungrier and thirstier. At the same time as they're going through a youth bulge and their countries are filling up with more ex powerful explosives and drones. So, more popular uprisings may be met with more authoritarian repression, leading to the further spread of extremism. If we keep with our law of effectiveness, the future may end up being like the past, only worse. So is there any hope for change? Could we possibly get rid of this bad, old law that's causing so much suffering and injustice around the world? Could we find a better way of getting our raw materials? Well, as you can imagine, it'll be challenging. Like I said, over 50% of the world's traded oil comes from countries 
that are either authoritarian or failed. So there's a lot of money at stake and the interests are very strong. But there is hope for change. This bad old rule of effectiveness makes no common sense. And fortunately, there is widespread agreement on a principle better than effectiveness that would bring accountability to the countries where the resources are. It's nothing other than the principle of Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address. A country belongs to its people. Every country belongs to its people, including the resources. And that means no one should be able to sell off the country's resources without being even minimally accountable to the owners of the resources, the people of the country. Now, that principle, as I said, enjoys widespread agreement. And you can tell that it's the solution to the resource curse because countries where there is public accountability, like Norway or Botswana, do not have the worst resource curse phenomena. They don't suffer from authoritarianism, civil war, poverty, and so on. Accountability is the solution to the resource curse. You can also see it by all of the big initiatives that we've been talking about earlier today in specialized discussions. All of the initiatives around resources for many years have unconsciously tried to do one thing. They've tried to get more power to the people. So transparency initiatives. One way of getting power to the people is telling them what's going on with their oil. Oil to cash. The government gives the money to the people and then has to tax it away and become more accountable to them. Kimberly process for blood diamonds. Stop armed groups from being able to sell minerals and gems to us. All of these initiatives, one way or another, are trying to get more power to the people to control natural resources. And when you look at what our leaders say around the world, they'll just stand up and say, the oil belongs to the people. So it's not only American presidents and the British prime minister, Australian prime minister, but the presidents of Ghana, Brazil, Mexico, the Norwegian parliament, even Ayatollah Khamenei stands up and says, the oil belongs to the people. And it's a very popular thing for politicians to say, because when we do polls in all regions of the world, we find strong majorities of people, even in the Middle East, who say that every country should be owned at the ultimate level by its people. Best of all, the treaties are already signed. If you look at Article I of both the major human rights treaties, they both just say all peoples may, for their own ends, freely dispose of their natural wealth and resources. Almost every major country has already signed up to these treaties. 98% of the people in the world live in a country that has already endorsed those words. So at the level of ideas, at least, we know the principle that should replace effectiveness. If you think about it, insofar as humanity has heroes, it's men like Gandhi and Mandela who fought and won the battle that a country belongs to its citizens. And we can be confident that we can abolish effectiveness for natural resources because in the biggest picture of all, this bad rule of might makes right has been abolished many times before. So this is the historical sections of this book, Blood Oil. 300 years ago, effectiveness, effectiveness was the law not only for natural resources, but for almost everything in international affairs, even for human beings. 300 years ago, the world's rule was whoever can seize Africans by force. 
can sell them to us. And under that rule, 12 million Africans were forced through the terrible Middle Passage where the survivors were bought legally as property here. Back then, might made right for human beings. Even 100 years ago, effectiveness made colonial rule legal. Back then, the international rule was if one country can keep coercive control over a people of another, they get the internationally recognized legal right to rule those people as a sovereign power. Might makes right. In our own times, this rule made apartheid legal. The international rule was any regime that can keep power over population can maintain a racist white rule. Ethnic cleansing, even genocide, used to be permitted by international law because international law was little more than a legitimation of power. But look, the good news is that all of the things that I've just mentioned are now violations of international law. Slave trade, colonial rule, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, genocide. These are all now violations of international law. And in fact, we've even abolished might makes right for a single natural resource, which is diamonds. It is now illegal to import diamonds from militias who have seized them by force. Now, I'm not claiming, of course, that because we've changed the law, we've magically abolished power. Slaves are still secretly trafficked across borders. Genocides still occur. Blood diamonds still do leak into global commerce. But the great progress we've made as humanity over the past 300 years is turning what used to be taken for granted legitimations of power into widely reviled crimes. We can have faith that, as Keo's book title says, that right makes might. So for the past few months, I've been running a charity called Clean Trade. Clean Trade is set up to promote the human right of all peoples to their resources. Clean Trade asks us in our own countries to change our own laws on our own soils so that they line up with our own principles that every country belongs to their people. We ask our own government to say, for example, to the Saudi government, who rules in your country is none of our business. All we're saying is, until the government there is more accountable to the people, you'll get none of our business for oil. We just don't believe we have the right to buy that oil from you because you're not accountable to the owners, the citizens of your country. We're asking states to change the laws that put us into business with these bad actors abroad. And the big ask is to stop importing authoritarian oil. Peacefully, gradually, responsibly, get us out of business with any authoritarians and armed groups who are in charge of oil. Now, the first thing you might wonder is, could we do that? And the answer is yes, we can. Economically, this is not a big ask. So right now, the US gets 15% of its crude oil consumption from authoritarian states. And we, am, we export much more oil than that to other countries. So we don't need to buy oil from authoritarians anymore. We could stop using that oil without almost any effect of the prices at the pump. But I have to say, as long as we're going to get away from 15% of oil, why don't we replace those barrels with cleaner, renewable sources of energy so that we can start developing the fuels of the future and get a win on climate too? The important thing is for our leaders just to stand up and to announce that we believe in this principle. 
standing by the side of peoples in places like the Middle East is our best peaceful hope for encouraging reforms in those countries that will get more power to the people so that they can run those countries in the way that they seem best. And I'm happy to say that clean trade already has its first big success. Brazil, the fifth biggest country in the world, has now introduced clean trade le uh, legislation, which would just ban all imports of oil from authoritarian countries. We're going to take the success from Brazil and go to Norway and Canada and maybe even the United States in time and say, if Brazil can do it, why can't we do it here too? So Brazil is the first clean trade country. We're also developing outreach to investors and businesses, and we're going to have a consumer power campaign too. We've done all the numbers. We know which oil companies do the most business with authoritarian regimes. So with our clever young technical friends, we're going to get you an app where you can just open the app and see all the gas stations around you with their clean trade score. Choose the one that does less business with authoritarian regimes. Press a button. It'll send the message to the company, and it will tell all your friends on social media that you've chosen to buy oil from a cleaner company. We can get ourselves out of business with the men of blood abroad. I mean, I know that this rule just seems to be the way the world works and the way the world always has to work. But if you think about it, that's how it seemed with the slave trade and apartheid and blood diamonds too. If we work together and just endorse our own principles in our own countries, we can get out of business with the men of blood. We can get to a world beyond blood oil. Thanks very much. Sure. You want to take questions or you want to call uh, people? Okay. So, right. so we'll, get on. we'll take uh, uh, some questions and if you raise your hand and then the microphone will go to you. Okay, the couple there. Um, thanks, thanks so much. That, uh, that was really inspiring and great. Um, my question is, so uh, assuming that there are ties between like the University of Michigan and oil companies, which I can't say for sure, but I just uh, think it's probably true, um, how should like college students and mem members of the U of M community um, like hold the university ac accountable and is it practical to uh, like stage divestment movements of sorts? Yeah, we really want to get you that information because student power is such great power. When you look at sweatshops, student power made a huge amount of difference. So we do want large institutions like this to go clean trade. And there's a lot of money in endowments of places like this. So a place like Michigan going clean trade and getting a clean trade portfolio, which will be revenue neutral, which is the key thing because that's the responsibility of the people who manage it. If we can give you a revenue neutral portfolio and you can get away from the companies that are doing the most business with the worst regimes, that sends a huge signal to the companies. Access to capital, I hate to say that access to capital really matters in our world. And this institution has a lot of capital. It could send a really clear signal to companies. So yes, we will get you the information about a clean trade portfolio. Thank you. Hi, um, so I'm, I'm a Venezuelan citizen. My family immigrated from there. And I just wanted to ask you about Venezuela because I think it might possibly provide a counterexample. Um, so you already talked about it as a paradigm case of the resource curse. And I fell in love with your work because I was thinking about, okay, what can possibly be done? Um, and originally I was really attracted to the proposal that you suggested in property rights of the resource curse. So not only does the US no longer um, do any business with an authoritarian like Maduro, but um, if China, for example, steps in, 
and starts buying the oil that we're no longer buying, you suggested that we, sh as Western nations, should create a trust, a sort of like clean hands trust. Yeah. Yes, do you still stand by that? Yes. Yes, so um, this was like very, you know, true to life because Maduro did say, I don't even care if the US does business with us anymore, we have China, we'll sell all our oil to China, but as PDVSA has collapsed there and Venezuela has gotten to the point where it's barely producing any oil, yeah. it's become really clear that Maduro staying in power wasn't dependent on, or is no longer dependent on the oil rents. And I think, I'm not like a sociologist, but I, I think it's kind of been a shift that we've seen from dependence on oil to dependence on cocaine and other racketeering, uh, yeah, I, I just organizations. And so I, seeing this example, it made me think, well, even if we do get to the point where we're not buying any oil from Venezuela, it may not matter to these autocrats. They might have different options for sort of staying in power. And I think I've seen maybe other voices suggesting that, you know, critically that possibly they think autocrats have more options for getting around mm -hmm. these sort of initiatives than you've possibly laid out in the book. So I was hoping you could respond to that. Thank you so much, and I really wish we could just talk about Venezuela for a while, because I think we both feel very deeply about this case, and, and you especially, of course. And it's such a tragic situation right now. I mean, you just can't believe when you open the newspaper. Largest oil reserves in the world. And the people are suffering, so. Uh, and as you say, they've run the national oil company into the ground. I read a story not too long ago. This is Pedavesa, which is one of the great oil companies in the world. They have to send two workers up to fix the equipment on the ladders because the workers are so hungry. Some have been fainting from hunger and dropping off, so the other guy is sent up to catch the first if he happens to fall off. It's just a disaster. Here's the question for us who are not Venezuelan citizens. You have a special role in this that we don't. What can we helpfully do in this situation? I think being aggressive in this situation would be a disaster for everybody. What can we do? We can get out of business with the Maduro regime. That regime might find alternative sources of income and might survive for a while. But I think the power of the United States actually, finally, doing the right thing, the right peaceful thing, and just stepping back and saying, we believe the oil of Venezuela belongs to the Venezuelan people, and we're just not going to buy it from anyone who's not minimally accountable to the Venezuelan people. I think that would be a significant step, and the best step that we can take. You're absolutely right, it's not going to be magic, but few things are magic, and this might really help. Thank you. How would you respond to policymakers that make the claim that it is imperative that the U.S. aligns itself with some of these authoritarian regimes for questions of national security and influence in these high risk and chaotic areas, and that maybe that's a necessary consequence of um, just like human rights violations, unfortunately? How's it going? How's it going with that alignment, you know? How's it going working behind the scenes for human rights and having the soft pressure? You know, it's better to engage than be left out. I just don't see the results. I mean, if it got results, maybe, but it's not. Look at, look at what the results are in the places. I mean, I put up that list of states in the Middle East where we've had a friendly regime. There's a, there's a story in the book of Jimmy Carter going to Tehran and giving a speech on the last day of 1977 and saying to the Shah, for 25 years, you've brought peace and stability to this country. We're honored to have you as a partner. You're obviously so successful because the people of your country love you. And that was 1977. We couldn't see it coming that the next 40 years, Iran would be a committed regional adversary. So the Shah. And then he fell, and we turned to Saddam, who again was our, our guy in the region until one night when he just decided to invade Kuwait, and then he caused the region a great amount of trouble. So the Shah to Saddam, we went to Gaddafi. 
How did that work out? We'd been with the Saudis for quite some time, our biggest friend. And the Saudis spent our oil money for years spreading its extreme intolerant version of Islam around the world, perhaps the biggest information campaign in human history. Wherever you go in developing countries now, you'll see Saudi-funded schools and mosques spreading this extreme form of Salafism, which then mutated into the jihadi extremism that became a serious national security threat for us. In the long term, I don't think that being in alliance with those kinds of regimes is in the national interest, even in our national security interests. The problem is we here can see the long term. Politicians are focused on the short term. If your horizon is the next six weeks, two months, your incentive is always to do what's always been done before. So it's up to us as the citizens who we hope have a voice in this country to get our politicians to be more like statesmen and to look to the longer term and who we really want to be dealing with in those countries. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. I was I thought I had a lot of very good, um, oh, uh, kind of the social points were interesting. Um, but I was curious about some of the more indirect types of uh, relationships um, since a lot of the economies that we're dealing with here are a little bit more diversified and we may be involved in business in other ways, like the um, China example was mentioned and Russia obviously is a, it's autocratic, but it's a much more diversified economy. How do you deal with those indirect costs of dealing with business with other companies and other industries that don't necessarily have to do with oil, but when those countries are still buying oil from these other um, more violent regimes in you know, Africa and the Middle East? So the, the programs here are only focused on oil. Doing business in other industries is okay. It's really just the oil industry and other resource extraction that we're focused on. And you think that that might cause issues. Is that right in sustaining regimes in some countries? I see. Good. So China is not an oil exporting country, so we don't have any clean trade policies directly towards China. I didn't describe the policy um, towards China, but there is a mechanism within clean trade to do something about this. And it's just what you were describing. So if China buys oil from Equatorial Guinea, one of the worst regimes in the world, then when we buy Chinese goods, we'll end up being having our hands soiled with stolen oil secondhand. What can we do about that? Well, again, the key is just to enforce property rights, right? This is essentially stolen oil. We don't want to buy stolen oil. So how can we do something to protect the property rights of the people of Equatorial Guinea? Here's the idea. If China buys $2 billion worth of oil from Equatorial Guinea, we put $2 billion worth of duties on Chinese goods as they come into the country. We take those duties and we hold it in trust for the people of Equatorial Guinea whose property has been stolen. And we say, whenever there's a minimally accountable government in that country, we'll return the money to the people uh, whose oil has been stolen. That gives everyone an incentive not to buy more oil from Equatorial Guinea until they have a better government. And it gives the people of Equatorial Guinea an extra incentive to try to take control of their country because there's a lot of money waiting for them. So thank you very much for that. Hi there, my name is Christopher Stodronovsky. I'm a PhD student in public health where I work on human rights and health issues. Um, in kind of listening to your talk, I could imagine a solution of the United States also just be let's ramp up our own oil production, which is what we're already doing. We've reached 3 million barrels per day, I think, in this last the week of like ending June 22nd. We're exporting which is like, 3 million a day. Right. Uh, I, my understanding is that we produced it in the United States. We do. We right. produce a lot more. Which gas. is above what Iran is producing at the present moment, which is about half of what Saudi Arabia is producing at the present moment. So what would you say to like a solution 
around these issues of the United States producing kind of more of the world's oil um, than these other kind of nations that are going through these human rights violations? It's going to happen. So when I started this project, they were talking about peak oil, peak oil supply. And they don't talk about that anymore. Um, now we're talking about peak oil demand, and it's mostly because of U.S. production. So you're absolutely right. U.S. production has really skyrocketed. It's the biggest, biggest story in energy. Total surprise to everybody. And it means that the U.S. has a lot of oil. That makes this project a lot easier to do, right? The authoritarians just don't have the leverage on us that they used to. So insofar as we have our own oil, we are less beholden to the regimes that we used to be. And you can see that this is affecting our foreign policy already. As I say, that's great for this project. But we also need to think about how can we get off oil just as fast as we can. So we do still import some authoritarian barrels. And we could get those barrels easily from another source. I was talking to Nick Butler, who does the energy column for the Financial Times, and he used to be a vice president at BP. And I said, Nick, how long would it take North America to get off of authoritarian oil? And he said, well, which countries? And I, I showed him the countries in red on that map that I showed you. And he said, really? Saudi Arabia? Algeria? I said, yeah, how long would it take? So he went off and he thought about it. And he came back next time we met. He said it would take a, couple, take a matter of months, almost costless. You just switch the barrels around. You have to do some stuff with the refineries. That's the main cost. But we could do it in a matter of months. Economics is not the problem. It's the politics. As usual, that's the problem. It's not the cost in the United States. It's actually going to our old allies, like Saudi Arabia, and saying, we're not going to do business in the old way anymore. So switch away from those barrels into the fuels of the future. That's the way to get a win on peace and justice and climate at the same time. Um, I was wondering, in regards to both the political aspect of it and in regards to the other question that he was asking before, where you suggested using sanctions on other countries to um, accommodate for the fact that we're also in different economic deals with them as well. Um, how you plan on solving those political issues or what you propose if you do have a proposition? Because looking at our own leaders and looking at other leaders of allies that aren't necessarily considered authoritarian, holding them accountable has been an issue in the past, especially in regards to money. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Are there special cases you're thinking of when it comes to that? No, sir, just generally. Good. Let me just quibble with one word you used, with this, which is sanctions. The, the stuff that I'm proposing is not really sanctions. Sanctions are punishments, and we're not trying to punish anyone. We're just trying to stick up for our own principles. So I'm just going to try to keep away from that word, but I, tell you, I totally take your point. And so the question is, how could we really take a principled stance with regard to these regimes, given how much trouble we've had doing that in the past? I have to tell you, that's a tough problem. And wouldn't it be remarkable if the United States took a principled stance both towards old enemies like Iran and towards old friends like Saudi Arabia and said, we're going to apply the same policy. Why would it do that? National security, for sure. But I have to say, the example that I'm inspired most by is the, is the end of the Atlantic slave trade. So in Britain, at the end of the 18th century, slave sugar was huge. I mean, it was a big part of the British economy. Lloyd's and Barclays had a lot of investment in the Caribbean plantations. The Church of England owned hundreds and hundreds of slaves in their own plantations. The first British millionaire was a plantation owner who was also a member of parliament. Almost the entire British elite had something wrapped up in the slave sugar trade. And of course, there were hundreds and hundreds of jobs in slave ship making and barrel making and so on. But then, as it happens, 12 Quakers met in a little room in London in 1787, and they just 
resolve that this moral horror must end. Nobody really thought much about the practice at all. But they got an inspired leader. Other leaders joined. They campaigned. They canvassed. And they convinced the people of the United Kingdom that this practice must end. It was the people who gave the impetus, and especially the women of the North. The people together, they boycotted slave sugar. They marched. They petitioned. And they just insisted, government after government, that this policy must end. It took them 60 years. This is a big lift. And we actually now have an estimate of how much it cost for Britain to end the slave trade. It cost them almost 2% of GDP every year for 60 years. But they did it, and it was the right thing to do. If the people are convinced it's the right thing to do, they can come together and bear some costs. This project will have nothing like those costs, and it will have a lot of compensating advantages. So we do need the people to stick up for the principle and to tell our government, we just don't want to be in business with these people anymore. Thank you. So just a quick hypothetical. Um, so I guess if we achieved our goal where uh, the West, I guess we'll say, uh, became accountable in our consumption of oil, or we suddenly were able to just move away from buying, I guess, the bad oil in a matter of months, right? Um, I guess, could you share what you imagine, uh, I guess, would happen to uh, all these states that are exporting oil uh, when suddenly that oil does not have the same value anymore, I guess? Yeah. How do they change, you know? Ultimately, this is a soft power strategy. You can see we're not using hard power, we're not invading, and so on. The power of this is the power of ideas. What can we peacefully do? What we can peacefully do is stand by the side of the people of these countries. And our doing that, our saying at last to the people of the Middle East, for example, we believe you own your resources. That's what we can peacefully do to empower them. Now, the transitions might be rocky. And I, I take it that this is the point of your question. It will be a transition to go from the current situation to more, even minimally, accountable governments in places, for example, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain. But you know, those governments have been c promising constitutional reforms for decades. They all have constitutions on the shelf that they keep telling the people will put, and then they keep putting it off. They have the things ready to go. My view is that there's reformers in these countries outside the palaces and inside the palaces too. And we can give support to those reformers by announcing publicly that we're standing up for this principle and putting our money where our mouth is by doing business in a different way. So that's the, what we can most peacefully do. And let me just say, even if transitions are rocky, business as usual will be even rockier. We really are sending hundreds of billions of dollars a year to some very violent and coercive actors. And it does seem that the Middle East is not going to be more stable if we keep doing that, if we keep inflating this balloon with more and more energy. Instability, almost certain. Uh, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Um, I have one question about the difference between uh, diamonds and oil. Yeah. So uh, the, you suggested that the, uh, you know, the uh, diamonds is prohibited to you know, export if they are taken by horse, horse, but the oil is still you know, under the law of effectiveness. And what do you think makes difference between those two natural resources? There's two things. Diamonds are much less important to the global economy than oil, so it's much easier to ban blood diamonds than it is to ban blood oil. But it's also just a historical contingency. And this is an interesting story for anyone who has a cause they want to further, like I have this cause. The blood diamond story is a fascinating story of some committed, idealistic activists who were all skilled up and got their message to political actors that blood diamonds must be banned. Now, when they started doing this, they got nowhere. Because blood diamonds were coming out of Sierra Leone. There's this terrible war. I don't know if you've seen the DiCaprio movie, Blood Diamond. But it's all true. I mean, 
as far as it can be. <laughs> it really was an awful war in Sierra Leone where these militias were amputating people to scare them away from the diamond fields. The activists saw that. They got hold of, for example, some congressmen here, and they got nowhere. And they got nowhere again. But they kept pushing, and they knew their stuff, and then the window of opportunity opened. And just as it happens, it was 9-11. Because blood diamonds were being sold from Sierra Leone through Charles Taylor of Liberia to Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda knew that it would need a store of value outside of the international banking system after 9-11 took place. And of course, diamonds are the best store of value. So blood diamonds were in the hands of Al-Qaeda. When that was found out, blood diamonds went to being a first order national security priority for the United States. And within 18 months, the bill banning blood diamonds was law in the United States and in most of the rich countries of the world. So for people who have a cause, we can just keep pushing, and the window of opportunity does open. We get our stuff plugged in. It becomes the new normal. Thank you. Hi. Um, how can the individual citizen in the West renounce their participation in authoritarian regimes like these when so many of our products and, uh, that are just a part of our daily lives are, are almost unavoidable in terms of use? Yeah. We want to give you, give you as many tools as we can. We can't do fair trade for oil because the oil companies won't let us trace it. And there's nothing we can do to make them. And we can't do fair trade for plastic. This is oil, of course. Computer keyboard, buttons of your clothes. We can't do fair trade for that because the supply chains are too complicated. So what can we do? Well, we will give you tools like this app that shows you where you can buy gas. We do endorse certain kinds of products. For example, there is a good smartphone that's free of conflict minerals as far as anyone can, can make it so. You can buy conflict-free gems. There are really good companies for that. So we want to get you as many tools as you can so you can send this message. If you want to do something right now, like now, you can go to change.org and sign a petition to help us drive movement in Brazil, which is our next big campaign, um, standing beside the Brazilian people as they take more control of the resources of our country. That's the kind of thing that we're hoping people will do. And we're really hoping to bring those campaigns home so that there's things we can do here, too. So we're going to try to give you all the tools we can. And thank you so much for being interested in that. That's crucial. Could you give us a breakdown of where all this profit goes uh, from blood oil? Um, I assume that I'm going to make an assumption that 90% of it goes into Swiss bank accounts of <laughs> dictators' family members. But you probably can give a better answer than that. You know, it's interesting. So last time I did the calculations, the average American household sends over $200 a year to authoritarian regimes and armed groups just by filling up with gas. And that's not to mention all the plastic and everything else we buy. So $200 a year from every household, that's a fair amount of money. You might think that some of it goes to personal corruption, and it is true that some of these oil regimes are spectacularly corrupt. I can't resist saying a word about the crown prince of Saudi Arabia even being on camera. Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, this reformer, recently not only bought the most expensive house in the world for $300 million, but also bought for his patron and friend in the Emirates that Da Vinci painting. Remember that Da Vinci painting that was the largest sale ever? His people bought that, so he could give it as a gift for $450 million. And one day he was in the south of France. He saw a yacht that he liked. It was a very nice yacht. It belonged to some Russian vodka tycoon. He sent his people to do the negotiations. People bought the yacht. Tycoon moved out. He moved in the same day. A one-day impulse purchase of a boat 
for $550 million. That's half a billion dollars. You could buy 2,700 Lamborghinis for yourself with that money. So some of these guys are spectacularly corrupt, and that is the money of the people that they're spending. But I have to say, most of the money does not go for super yachts and paintings and prostitutes. Most of the money goes to governing the country. It's an extremely expensive business to keep a population either coerced or bought off. So most of the money actually does going to paying the security forces and especially just paying the salaries of all of these people who take up jobs in the government or the army who are then loyal to you because this is where they're standing and their paycheck comes from. So personal corruption is a big thing, but actually this is the model of governance of oil states that you spend the oil money on coercion and patronage. Thank you. Thanks very much for your talk um, and answering our questions. I'm curious if you could talk about any examples of um, authoritarian petro states that have made successful democratic transitions. Because um, when the, the Green Revolution, the first thing that comes to mind in thinking about the fits and starts there and the lack of, in, in my view, real success um, so far. And uh, it certainly gives me pause when thinking about what can I look at empirically that I can buy into uh, the practice, the um, sort of, you know, no pay for play practice that is going to work and facilitate, um, okay. you know, free and open uh, governments. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you for these fantastic discussion points. I mean, this is just terrific. I wish I could stay in Michigan all the time. <laughs> there are very few examples of authoritarians making a transition. And it's because of this last exchange we had. This is their model of governance. The money gets poured in at the top of these countries, and they use it for coercion and patronage. And it's hard to change your model. There are countries that have diversified away from oil, and it happens when the country runs out of oil, at least oil revenues per capita. So the less oil money you have for each citizen, the less you have to either coerce them or buy them off. The countries that you see transitioning, diversifying away from oil, countries like Indonesia, Mexico, now Nigeria, and it's all because they're running out of oil money per capita. It's hard for countries to do this. So when you hear people say, we're going to diversify away from oil, be skeptical. They really do need the extra push from us to say, look, you really have to find a different mode of governance in your country. That's what's going to help them make the kind of transition we're asking for. Thank you. One more question. Mm, so I just had some questions about how um, you want to decide like which countries are authoritarian or sufficiently authoritarian that we no longer want to do business with them. I know that you've talked about Freedom House and um, taking, you know, I guess all sevens as being a, a clear indicator that this is such an authoritarian government we shouldn't do business. But I, I'm just, you know, thinking by that point, the country is going to be in such a bad state that yeah. many people have already died. Do you yeah. have any suggestions for sort of identifying before? that point when yes. our, like, this country should start pulling out of That's trade. such an important question. I can tell you're still working from that 2008 article. So can I recommend the book to you, Blood Oil, which has an updated and expanded account of this very thing. This is really important. What does it mean for a country to be too authoritarian or failed that we won't buy oil from it? So what does it mean for a country to be minimally accountable to its citizens? Here's four basic tests, which I think are secure enough to be used in international politics. Can the citizens of the country find out what the government's doing with their oil? Can the citizens talk with each other about that without fearing disappearance or death? Can the citizens peacefully protest what the government's doing with their oil without fearing disappearance or death? And if a majority of citizens strongly disapprove of what the government's doing with the oil, will the government policy change in a reasonable time? 
So we're not asking for every country to be Norway here. These are really minimal civil liberties and political rights. We have good metrics for measuring that. Freedom House is one such metric. We use a metric of metrics. We combine a lot of metrics to, to get the bias out. And we do have a line that says, these countries are OK. Those countries are not. We need a bright line because there's a lot of money at stake. And businesses and investors need clarity to know who they can do business with and who they can't. So if you go to the Clean Trade website, I hope next week, you'll see the countries that are above and below. The methodology will all be transparent. And using this very basic idea of the people owning the resources measured in these simple ways, I hope we can get our leaders to say, look, doing business the way we've been doing it just isn't working, and we have to try something new. Maybe I can leave you with my favorite quote from John Stuart Mill. It's the mistake of reformers and philanthropists to nibble at the consequences of injustice instead of attacking the cause of the injustice itself. We really need to get down to the cause of the resource curse. In fact, we have two last questions. Uh, what you say, oh, okay. there's something about the role of the oil companies in this complex relationship between the uh, oil producing companies. It's complex. Some of the countries have been in these countries for decades. Shell in Nigeria, Total in Myanmar. Often the companies are entwined in national governance. What was the second one you said? Total. Shell, oh, okay. Shell in Nigeria, Total in Myanmar. Oh, Myanmar. Uh, Burma, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the countries are often involved in these countries. I talk to people in the oil, oil companies a lot. A lot of time they're just as frustrated as we are at what's going on in governance in the country. Because when there's government failure in a place like Nigeria, the companies are called in to do remedial governance. So it's the companies that are providing security and education and sometimes sanitation and even community mediation. And oil companies hate that. They're no good at it. They know that they're no good at it. It's beyond their, their core competences. So they would actually in many cases prefer a government that's more capable of taking care of the people. The problem for the oil companies, of course, is competitive advantage. If Shell doesn't go in to Nigeria, then someone else will just go in and take the oil. So for reasons of governance and of simple geopolitical stability, most of the oil people I talk to in the major corporations say they would be glad if we could get to the state where clean trade were universal, if there were only oil gotten out of countries that were accountable to their citizens. But they all say the same thing. Shell, BP, Total. Everybody says, yes, we would love that so long as our competitors have to do it too. All they need is a level playing field. If we can get them a level playing field, then they'll be on board with us for simple business reasons. You, um, as a follow-up to my last question to you, if um, most of the money goes to pay off people, um, bri and which is basically means bribery, I would assume, um, why have so many countries chosen that route if it's not even going into their own personal family's Swiss bank accounts, if most of it goes for bribery? Why can't they follow a model of, like, say, uh, Norway? It's interesting. You know, as I look more into these countries, I come to understand that it's really us here that's the anomaly. The system of governance in these kinds of countries has been one way or another the norm throughout most of human history. There's a lot of patron-client relations that you see in traditional governance. It's really here where we have some rule of law. This is what's unusual. And I don't know if you remember Gordon Brown, the British prime minister, not a, perhaps not the most inspiring one. The funniest thing Gordon Brown ever said was, when it comes to the rule of law, the first five centuries are the hardest. 
And I think that's true. I mean, it's hard to get rule of law, like even as far as we have it here. What they have there really is more like the natural system of governance, where money flows down for employment and patronage flows up in political support. So it's hard to change the system because that is the way that it always has been. And they need a reason to change away to that, from that system to one where a basic rule of law is enforced. Thank you. Great. We have to close our session here. But uh, Professor Wenar has agreed to stay around and sign a copy. And you can purchase the, uh, the book over there at the counter. So. Um, if you're interested, please stay for that. And before that, please join me in thanking Professor Winar for the wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you.